So uh, we're going to start at the beginning. Uh, as was said earlier, I'm a complete uh, obsessive, compulsive collector of vintage computer hardware. Uh, I got interested in this in the 80s when I was working with Xerox Palo Alto Research Center and asked the question, where did the mouse and the Ethernet and Windows and icons coming from? So I started to actually collect all the hardware. And the hardware you're going to see here is not mine, but it, it goes back even further. So what the question that I had was, how did we get here with computing architecture? Because we're all we're living within something called the von Neumann bottleneck. Does anyone know the von Neumann bottleneck? It means that data comes like an hourglass uh, in from one end, goes through one or more processors, and ends up in a data store on the other end. And then you flip the hourglass around, and then it happens again. Uh, this is, in a sense, we're working through the hourglass, like looking through the hourglass uh, that Alice was doing. Uh, so the question is, if we're working through the hourglass, can Alice or any of us reach the wonderland of AI, <laughs> the promise of AI? And possibly not. So that's the, the question we're posing this morning. So in Tegmark's uh, roadmap for AI, uh, to meet its long-term ambitions, which it means it needs to emulate natural systems. Can we get there from here? Can we get to artificial narrow inte intelligence, general or superhuman intelligence with the computing hardware we have? And I don't believe we can. So uh, just met Holger last night, and I found his essay on the site to be extremely sort of prescient and on the point. Uh, pointing out that effective AI algorithms are difficult to design, implement, and maintain. They also require a high level of expertise to deploy successfully in practice and many stringent requirements on performance, robustness, predictability, and safety, as we're going to talk about here, will make this even harder in the future. So we're actually climbing up a, a slope here. It's almost like the beginnings of computing. It was very hard to do, not easy. So uh, a question that uh, both Holger and Tegmark ask, could AI systems themselves be used to design and code them in the future? Can we do that sort of uh, stacking upon stacking that technology generally does? But the question underlying all of this, are our computing systems up to the task? Uh, so the answer for the answer, let's look back to the origins of computing. Uh, deep in the 1930s, uh, Alan Turing coming up with this universal uh, computing mechanism in the mathematics that led to the, uh, the Colossus running at Bletchley Park as the first data center in the world. And this is actually, I, I was given a tour of the Mark II, which is working and decodes uh, German submarine codes, this fantastic data flow system. Uh, in the late 1940s, Systems like ENIAC were programmed with plug boards on the outside until I think Mockley or someone said, it makes no sense to work for three weeks to set up for a 30-minute calculation. <laughs> you know, <laughs> notice the ladies, they were the first computers. You know, they would not only set up uh, things like ENIAC, but they actually did the, the manual calculator uh, steps during the World War II and for NASA, as you saw in Hidden Figures a tremendous uh, documentary film. So enter John von Neumann. Now John von Neumann, part of the Hungarian Mafia, <laughs> they included Edward Teller, they spoke in a code no one could break called Hungarian. <laughs> 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 I'm told that if, if you are not a baby being raised around Hungarians, you can never learn how to speak it. Uh, but anyway, so this was an important group in World War II he was part of the uh, Los Alamos project. And when he left Los Alamos, he decided to go and take up a position at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, working for uh, Robert Oppenheimer, of course, who was the scientific director at Los Alamos. And because, as he said at the time, we're going to do something more important than the bomb. We're going to create automatic computing. So. Here's uh, the institute on the left, established in the 1930s. 
uh, it was uh, established to be a, p a place for pure thought, uh, pure scholarship, without s the messy inconvenience of students or laboratories. <laughs> uh, so my, my colleagues there, are sort of li it's sort of an academic tomb. It's the, it's the ivory tower's ivory tower. <laughs> so it, in order for uh, von Neumann to realize his vision, he had to actually hide the computing project away from Fold Hall, which is what you see here on the left. So they built this brick building, which is now the kindergarten, some, some distance from Fold Hall to do the ECP, the electronic computer at Princeton. And he came up with uh, this mechanism uh, so that in order not to have plugs going from the outside of the machine, they used Norbert Wiener's idea of cybernetics and feedback to have this bizarre and strangely un, you know, uh, alien concept of the instruction for the machine is in the same memory as is used to store its results. And it's completely internal, completely cybernetic. Uh, this is really before the understanding of how biology worked uh, with RNA and DNA, which is also a completely cybernetic system. Uh, but this is his architecture, and it's the architecture we all use. It has one limitation. It has this bottleneck here, where everything is just pouring through the execution unit. So here's von Neumann in 1952 with the New York Times, uh, where the launch of this wonderful machine, uh, it had a 2,000 vacuum tubes. It had these, these tubes down on the bottom are RCA storage uh, tubes, uh, cathode ray tubes that would read and write spots to give it a fast cache memory. Uh, the CPU is up above. They later added a drum. They added a card reader. Uh, and they created the model for computing. And what I went through all of von Neumann's archives about 10 years ago uh, at the Institute to search for clues. And I found one letter that said, we don't want to file any patents or patents on this thing because we'll end up paying the lawyers more than it costs the machine. <laughs> so what we will do is if you, if you write to the Institute and you say, I'm, I'm you know, the Army Dugway Proving Ground or I'm UCLA or whatever, and you want to be on our mailing list, we will send you quarterly reports on the progress of the construction of this machine, including all our ideas, all our questions, everything, and we'll just give it away. We'll open source it. So that if a lawyer should come to us, and, and this actually did happen, uh, the IAS could say, oh, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to approach the US Army. You're going to have to approach the Uni University of Illinois with your challenge, that, with your infringement claim. And it actually was a way to defend the innovation against uh, the IP struggles that, say, for instance, uh, happened around Edison's labs and Edison's innovations in the early part of the century. So this machine became distributed as an open source architecture. And this is why you're carrying one in your pocket today. There it is, it's in all its glory. Uh, I, I looked through the, the reports on uh, the, the contractor who built the building and the contractor was asking, let me understand, you need a, a class A air evacuation system in a building which also has a chalkboard <laughs> installed. <laughs> we don't understand. Are they supposed to be two different rooms? No, no. They're using the mathematics uh, to work the machine. So von Neumann, this is attributed to von Neumann. I'm, I actually am working through George Dyson to figure out if, uh, where, where this came. But this idea that that the computer that they built at Princeton was a contingency designed to just get some work done. But in no way does it represent a long-term solution for computing, especially when it comes to working with natural systems. So von Neumann felt, this: we just got this thing to work, and it actually won't do natural systems very well. And I'll show you how this, uh, how this panned out. So the first program for the ECP, which was called the Mathematics of the Machine, not a program, that's an interesting kind of evolution, uh, was for nuclear weapons. It was actually used for one of the big uh, nuclear weapons tests in the South Pacific. The second one was for weather prediction, computational meteorology. The third one is this program here. Uh, this is Niels Baricelli, who is a Norwegian-Italian investigator, a brilliant man, uh, who wanted to try to simulate life on this thing. This is 1953. So this is some of his punch cards here in his notes. 
And this is the experiments in biometric evolution, bionumeric evolution, to find out if it's possible uh, between bionumerical and biological phenomena, right, natural systems, and determine uh, how heredity uh, changes in selection to determine whether or one organism is able to speed up their evolution by gene replacements. This is a big task for the first computer, programmable computer, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, and it, 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 he was able to do things. So here are the Baricelli blueprints. And they're basically shots from either the cards or they're shots sometimes from the CRT of the data dump of the memory of these basically Conway's game of life in 1953. And you can see sort of almost like gliders going through there if you're A-life aficionados. And however, uh, this was very interesting to me to find this because I was starting to work with this man, Freeman Dyson, who we, we know and love. And I met with him in his office and I said, Freeman, I just went through the archives because he had rang them up so that I could go over and go through the whole archives. And I've determined that we're still hamstrung by the same problem of the von Neumann bottleneck because I was building a system called the evolution grid. Uh, which ended up running at UC San Diego, it had the same problems, the boundary problems of trying to simulate a large-scale uh, multivariate, multi-object system where it would go across the boundary of the machine and have to go to the next tile. And how do you do selection? And how do you, how do you actually run what is effectively trying to be a natural system in a system that can't do it, that has this bottleneck, that has this hourglass? And these are my notes from talking to Freeman about it. And at that point, I thought, well, it's hopeless. We can't use digital computation to solve origin of life. We have to use chemistry, and you'll see that more on that tonight. So those are the notes for what eventually did get built within the limitations. So Peter Bentley at UCL has come up with this really wonderful uh, table uh, corresponding conventional and natural systems that compute you know, your body versus your iPhone. And uh, <laughs> it's amazing. They're one-to-one, -one, diametrically opposed. The natural world computes in a different way, absolutely different way, uh, very effectively in conventional computing for what we need to do. But uh, if, if AI has this uh, ambition to do more natural, biological-type things, it's, gonna, it's running up against this hard limit. That the fact that there's virtually nothing that correspond and corresponds from the natural world into the digital world. There's virtually nothing. As I'm not a big believer in the singularity, and I, I, I wrote so much to Ray Kurzweil. I, I did all the numbers for his singularity book, the com computation curve numbers he shows. He hired me in like 2000, 2001 to do that, and I wrote him an essay why you couldn't claim anything from these numbers. <laughs> anyway, we had lunch later. I didn't bring it up. <laughs> Uh, so here, let's take a look at the non-living world. Here's some, some gravel on the beach in, in Brighton. Uh, it supports a huge number of, of parallel innovative interactions, but they're finite and bound. You know, they just happen and then they stop, basically like, like gravel moving. In the natural world, uh, it supports infinitely repeatable com computations in a way, in a massively parallel fashion that are unbounded. They just keep going and going and going, driven by en cycles of energy. Let's look deeper. So here's E. coli. It's a massive ca uh, co parallel computing universe. This is from David Goodsell's wonderful book. If, if you really want to take a look inside the cell, you should read Goodsell's book from The Machinery of Life. Now, to give you an idea of the breathtaking scope of, of computation going on in the cell, take a look at this. This is a 100 nanometer uh, uh, volume of cytoplasm, 100 nanometers on the side. This is not a big part of the cell. This is what it contains, 450 proteins. These are tools that fold and do things and catalyze things and break things, 450 in that volume. 30 ribosomes, these are the huge chemical factories that make the proteins. You know, TN tRNA on the way to the ribosome, 340 of those. Messenger RNA molecules, 30,000 small molecules that feed the system amino acids, nucleotides, sugars, ATP, in that tiny volume, 
super crowded. 50,000 ions of various types. And the 70% is water, and the water is the mechanism that slams everything around and bangs everything and kind of gets it, gets it into place. Now this may not run. No, that didn't run. So there's vast computing going on in, in biology that we can learn from. It's a different style of computing. But if we look at the evolution of our computing from the ECP to supercomputing grids to parallel processing, which is they are still all von Neumann machines, right? And we're pushing the limits. We're pushing more of those spreadsheets and payroll and everything, and we're processing through that one pipe. And it, it seems to us we're making progress. But since von Neumann machines have taken over the world, could they simulate the action of a, living, a single living cell? Well, I did some, some calculation with friends in the supercomputing uh, super community, and we looked at a single neuron. And we looked at the molecular dynamics level simulation of one neuron with all its dendrites and axons and things like this. And we, we looked at just the MD costs for doing everything. And it came down to the 10 top supercomputing networks in the world put together could not do one neuron, period, in, in, in any kind of predictive fashion. So all of these efforts to do sort of cog brain kinds of things that are saying, well, just make a simplified neuron. Well, what do you simplify out of the equation? What do you not include? So they couldn't simulate, all the computers in the world probably couldn't simulate this. Uh, we're underpowered by six orders of magnitude. So, but can the next generation of AI move to a new computing paradigm? And I believe that it can, but we have to actually start work on this now. And we'll take this up at dinner. <laughs> <laughs>